Hi guys, I have a fantastic interview for you today. I am with Darren Vo. Yes, I know the surname is very similar to mine, isn't it? Yes. Um, he is the president of Icomia and also my husband of 31 years. So um, it's been interesting to interview him in this uh, in this really interesting um, information from Icomia about the uh, the future of decarbonisation of the recreational boating industry. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, and welcome to the Boat Princess podcast. My name is Nikki Vo, and I'm your host. I am a boat owner, a marina owner, a director on the Marina Industries Association and a huge advocate for boating. In this series, I'm sharing the stories from every nook of the boating industry with the intention of encouraging more women to join me and for more women to get behind the helm too. I want to share the experience and opportunities of boating, of the boating industry, and I want you to join me as I bring the conversations and answer all the questions you've had. Boating is not just for the glamorous and rich and famous. It's full of beautiful and interesting people making the most of our natural environment and getting out there, enjoying the waterways. So let's set off the lines, take over the helm and escape to the world of boating. So welcome, Darren Vaux, president of Icomia. Tell me, what is Icomia? Oh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so Icomia stands for uh, the International Council of Marine Industry Associations. So we're the global peak body uh, for the recreational marine industry. And our members are basically the leading trade associations for the recreational marine industry around the world. So we have 40 members made up of sort of country representatives and, and sustaining members, which are large multinational corporations. Um, but we are effectively the voice of the recreational marine industry. So, for example, for Australian listeners, it's the MIA and the BIA are members? Yeah. So you look at that and you go, so the Boating Industry Association, Marine Industries Association and Amex are the members of ICOMIA. Okay. And so ICOMIA is effectively, for want of a better term, the global um, equivalent to those associations. So those associations are representing their members in their countries and then ICOMIA is over the top of those associations. Yeah, so we deal with fundamentally all the international issues. So as an example, uh, there's 147 ISO standards that affect the recreational marine industry. So ICOMIA represents the global industry on those. But one of the main things we do is actually bring all of our members together to enable them to collaborate um, so that we can share our intellectual property from around the world, share our challenges and work together to actually take our industry forward. And I think that's one of our main goals is to provide a platform for people to collaborate. And I've seen that in action at World Marina's Conference myself and it's it's really wonderful to see so many of them, the members of ICOMIA come together to discuss the issues, the problems, the things that are coming in the future and 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 all helping each other. It's, it's a really great, great thing to see in action. I think it's a really interesting one. When we have our... Um our annual Congress and uh, our annual general meeting, we usually put out the flags of the countries that sit around the table. And and it's a great reflection of the way that people from different cultures um, with different languages as their first language, but all come together you know, with a shared passion for recreational boating and actually seeing the industry prosper and, and really, I guess, um, focusing on actually getting more people uh, to share and enjoy the benefits that recreational boating has to offer. And I think that's the, one of the driving forces behind our industry is is bringing people together so that we can collectively uh, get more people into boating. So I, I know um, as an Australian, you know, that we, we look to the MIA, the BIA and Amex, and we know they do a whole bunch of different things, but there's a lot of things going on there sometimes that we don't necessarily know about as an industry. If they're not doing their job, then our job as an industry gets harder. So I'm guessing 
it's the same scenario for Icomia. If you're not doing what Icomia does, it gets harder for the associations. Yeah, well, it's it's actually the dichotomy that all trade associations suffer, that if they do their job really well, if their platform of government advocacy is excellent, if they work well in all of the international and local standards, if they've built great collaborations and sharing of information, then it's members, in our case for Icomia, our trade associations, but the trade association's own members, if the members aren't, experience prob- aren't experiencing problems, then in some respects they go, well, I don't really know what our association does because we don't seem to have any issues that they need to address. And it's a, it's a really interesting one because an association that doesn't do its job well and the industry is faced with enormous amounts of problems has you know great engagement with its members because it needs to solve its members problems so it's a it's a great challenge for all and it's not just our industry it's all industries and i guess part of it is that we need to have really good communication so our members do understand all the work that we're doing for them uh, you know, behind the scenes in a lot of respects and, you know, because there's an extraordinary amount of work that goes on and I guess even just the projects that we do and all those sorts of things are so important for our industry because we're not just looking for today, we're looking to the future and that's part of our, our remit is to ensure that we set our industry up for a prosperous future. And that's what we're here to talk about today, the future, because the boating industry has a big challenge ahead with um, the environmental mental impact that we have on the world, the, the the environment that we enjoy, the ocean, is incredibly important to our lifestyle. So we need to make sure that we are doing things to, to take care of that. So um, I know Icomia has um, taken the lead, if you like, and, and said, okay, we need to be careful that we as an industry um, take the lead on this and and find out what we need to do. So um, you've conducted a massive, massive study, haven't you? Tell me about that. Yeah, so I, I guess the first thing that's important is that that um, Icomia and our trade associations around the world, uh, our priority in relation to environmental sustainability is not new. It's something that we've literally been working on for decades and it's predicated on the basis that that our industry our industry success is actually based on on being able to operate within a pristine environment. So whether our industrial processes have impact on the environment or whether our recreational boaters have an impact on the environment, it's all about us looking at it and saying, what do we do um, to improve that sustainability? Now, um, a very hot topic at the moment, of course, is decarbonisation. In fact, as we speak today in early December, COP28 is going on in Dubai. Um, and in that context, um, you know, the, it, it's all coming back to the commitments that were made under the Paris Agreement by 196 countries where they all came together and signed up to the pledge that, that um, greenhouse gas emissions would peak in 2025 and that we're all committing to a reduction by 43% uh, by 2030. Now, that's a big yeah, ask. It's it's a massive ask. And mm. and 2030 is like next week because, mm. you know, we're just about to roll over into 2024 and in in things of that scale. Now, the harsh reality is right now, today, we're not on target. And, in fact, the what's really important about that to understand is that the reduction of 43%, the scientists have indicated that the the reasoning behind that is that that should be able to keep global warming to one and a half degrees. And one and a half degrees is seen of, as the threshold for acceptability, recognising there'll still be consequences of that, but almost like that's the threshold at which we can manage it. We're not there. And, mm. and I think the latest figures that I saw is that they're predicting 1.8 and there's great uncertainty about that, what that means. So the reality of it is um, if we're not there and governments are committing to it, well, the only thing that governments and regulators and policymakers have at their disposal is to impose restrictions on, on the community or on industry to force them to do it. And so that's the platform upon which uh, Icomia has embarked on this comprehensive decarbonisation study. So that I guess policymakers can make an informed decision as opposed to a, oh, let's just do this and that might work. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, and you're absolutely right because one of the biggest issues is People make decisions based on the information available to them. And the reality is in this space, surprisingly, is there's a significant information void. And so we've taken the initiative um, to do, and this project's been going on for at least two years, um, but to actually undertake the most comprehensive 
um, decarbonisation study, uh, certainly of the recreational marine industry, but in, in a lot of respects, I think more comprehensive than are done in a lot of industries, because um, this framework is a full life cycle assessment. So that means that we're looking at effectively the cradle to grave. So in terms of the products that we produce right from their inception, the materials from where they come from, um, the mines, the wells and all those sorts of things, right through its entire manufacturing phase, right through its operating phase, right up until its end of life processes. So that's the sort of term cradle to grave. And I guess another one we use is well to wake. In other words, in terms of the manufacturing phase is looking at and go, you know, the materials and energies, for instance, right out of the well, right out of the ground, right out of the source that it comes from to the point that the propulsion delivers wake and moves the boat forward. So our focus is on the propulsion system more so than the vessels themselves, but it's looking at a whole range of different propulsion systems and comparing them right down in terms of the embodied carbon in all aspects of, of the use of the craft through its entire life. Wow, that's a big study with a lot of information in it. And the boating industry is a very complex one that policymakers don't necessarily know a great deal about. So it's, it is actually really important for, you know, an association like yourselves to actually put that information forward so that, that they can understand it a little bit more because yeah, boating is, is boating. It's very unique, isn't it? Yeah, and I think um, there's a couple of aspects to it. One is that we need to undertake this report in a way that policymakers could rely on it, that the data integrity was absolutely, um, you know, it had the full credibility. And I guess part of that is that you know, we're a trade association, so therefore, uh, and it's been funded by ICOMIA. So the process was to say, how do we create the independence of the report so the research can be considered to have you know, absolute credibility? And, and in doing so, I guess we engaged uh, Ricardo, who are an international consultant in 20 countries, you know, 3,000 odd employees around the world. But importantly, they're recognised as the global leader in undertaking these type of studies, LCA analysis. They do it across a whole range of different industries as well, whether it's defence or aeronautics or transport or water or finance and, and all of those sorts of elements. But more importantly, they are seen um, by governments and policymakers as a credible group who actually understand those particular aspects. And so to me, I think that that was such an important part. But even beyond that, we had it peer reviewed by three independent parties, two of them doing the technical review and the third one as a dev devil's advocate review. In other words, to look at all the all the conclusions that were put forward and to challenge them. And I think we're very happy. It's a 558 page report. It's wow. a very data heavy um, exercise, but the reality of it is that it, it is an absolute comprehensive um, study that people can take you know the data from understand it look at it and then you know more importantly and most importantly industry and policymakers alike can start to make informed decisions about what to do between now uh, and the future because we the study is basically looking to the future to 2035 you know the data sets that are built into it are looking to what projections there are to 2035 so it's not it's not a hindsight review, it's a, it's a projection because we're trying to create a pathway to decarbonise the recreational marine industry and this is it. It's great. So in other words, what you're saying there is that this hasn't been funded by some oil producer or, you know, there are some cynics that are going to be listening to this, going to be saying, oh, yeah, this study's been produced by the boating industry, but, you know, can can we address those cynics that this is a true study that's been produced for the entire industry and the consumer, not funded by, you know, I don't know, an engine manufacturer or something. So you know? so I think I think the key thing here is that, sure, it's funded by Icomia and Icomia is the representative of the recreational marine industry. But we recognise that, that in doing so, um, we've needed to engage Ricardo and outline the things that I said before about doing, you know, having it done independently uh, prepared, having it peer reviewed, having it analysed so that it does stand alone. And I think it is a really key issue and I think that that's the important thing. It's not a study that we've, we've done ourselves, yep. it's the Ricardo study yeah. and they've been engaged to actually perform it. And I think that's 
that's as strong as it can be in terms of addressing that issue. Yeah, because it's it's not in in the boating industry's interest. They've done it as a completely independent study, as as an engaged and very well recognised um, party in doing that. They have to maintain their reputation very strongly, don't they? So that's really really important for those uh, that, that that may you know be a little bit judgmental yeah. of yeah. that process. Yeah. Now, um, what about other areas of LCA decarbonisation? Well, let's, well, let's talk about the actual decarbonisation carbonization study at this point first. Um, what in that study um, has been done to find the results? What, what, what did they put together? Yeah. So I think, so I guess the first thing is what's the scope? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the scope of it was orientated towards trying to identify the most representative set of recreational craft and the most representative set of propulsion alternatives. Now, I think the important thing is to start with is that, that this is about recreational craft It's and, and essentially vessels under 24 metres. Okay, so super yachts are out of the picture. Yeah, so, so super yachts have got a completely different usage profile to typical recreational craft. And I think there, there is the potential for that to be a logical extension of this report as a phase two, but this report specifically addresses vessels under 24 metres. And in fact, the largest vessel that was considered in the study was 19 metres. So okay. um, the way that we did it was we had nine different craft types. So if we look at what those craft types were, we had things like an inflatable boat, a runaway, a, a, a runaround boat, a runabout, a fishing boat, a PWC, a pontoon boat, displacement motor boat, an inland waterways vessel, a high performance motor yacht and a sailing yacht. Okay. So, And the reason those particular craft were selected is that they're representative of you know, the vast majority of vessels that are currently sold in the marketplace. Uh, but more importantly, in some respects because of scale, they're also very reflective of the existing fleet. Okay. And I think that that's what needs to be taken into account. Even though this particular study is talking about new vessels, we need to be cognizant of the scale of the existing fleet which we can then sort of talk about when, the, when we look at the results, what that actually means in that regard. So then when we take those nine vessel types, we've then got five different um, alternatives for propulsion. One is the baseline, and that is fossil fuel, um, fossil fuels used in ICEs, internal combustion engines. Um, we then have uh, sustainable, what's called drop-in fuels. So they are um, fuels that are made from waste feedstocks, cooking oils, various other things. So they're made from non-fossil fuels, but they are effectively can be put into the existing engines as they exist. So that's why they're called dropping because you can literally you just put them drop in the tank? Them in. You can just put them in. Okay. Um, the other one then is to look at hybrid electric, electric using sustainable fuels on the hybrid ICE, ICE stage, full battery electric, and then we've looked at hydrogen, but hydrogen used in two ways in an ICE, internal combustion engine for um, for propulsion, or in a fuel cell. So that gives us the, the broader spread. Now, there are different types of fuels and alternatives, particularly in the dropping fuel sense with various methanols and, and ammonias and things like that. But the reality is in, in doing the evaluation, this is, this is a really good um, representative set. And so if you look at that, we've got five different types of fuel and propulsion systems, and then we've got nine different craft types. So we've done full cradle-to-grave LCA analysis of 45 different scenarios. And I think it's important to understand that we're talking about looking at where the materials come from for every component in the propulsion system, what the transport implications are or where they come from, what the manufacturing processes are, and using all the best data sets to basically assemble that to work out the full embodied carbon in the entire process. And I think that's so important because um, there are so many parts, particularly the low operating utilisation of recreational craft that has a big, big impact on the way we consider it. Okay, so three things I need to question out all all of that. One is we need to explain to our listeners when we're talking about propulsion systems what yep. we're talking about. Yep. We're okay. talking about. So the first thing is that it's about what we're looking at is the engines. So we're looking at the fuel, the where the energy comes from. So that's either going to be a fuel or it's going to be electricity. And then we're looking at the engines, which are either going to be internal combustion engines or electric motors. 
And so we're talking about the energy and system that converts that energy into forward motion of a boat. Cool. And then LCA stands for? Life cycle assessment. So we're calculating the embodied carbon in every component of the life cycle of a particular craft type or propulsion system. Okay. And then there was a third, and I, it's, I've completely it'll, forgotten it. It'll come back. <laughs> maybe it's the maybe it's the low operating utilization of boats because it's probably this yes, is probably a really that's, that was it well done <laughs> that was my third yes point. that was it so yeah. um and and this is a really interesting one I think firstly boats have much more in common with aeroplanes than they do with cars okay and the reason being is that boats are all about thrust and so it takes 10 times the amount of energy to move a boat through the water than it does a car over land. Okay. And if you think about it, what most cars are doing most of the time is driving. What most boats are doing most of the time is sitting around. True. And so one of the things that's really important, and I think this, this comes as a surprise to people when you say it, but when they think about it, it makes sense, is that the average engine hours for a recreational vessel is less than 50 hours per year. And I think that the reason that that's um, so important is that if you've got a lot of carbon embodied in the manufacturing process of a craft and you're going to save carbon by a particular propulsion system, it's really difficult to offset increased levels of carbon because the operating hours are so small. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that as a result, that's a really important part of it. And I think... Part of the issue, if you look at a policymaker point of view, is about perception. And that perception is a result of the way that we as an industry represent our products. So if you look in a magazine and you say there's a picture of a boat or you see the imagery or see things, often you're looking at those boats and they're going very fast. They're going very fast. And they're fast. under power and they're doing all of those sorts of things. So the perception to, is that's what boating is. To make them look exciting. But the yes. reality is most people get on their boat, they might drive it at slow speed for an hour and either pick up a mooring, drop an anchor, do something, and either or drift, or say they're going to go fishing, they're going to go swimming, they're going to do a whole range of other things. And so as a consequence, for a day out on a boat, the engine would be lucky to run for two hours. And if you do that 20, 25 times a year, there's your 50 hours. And I think the important thing is that data set that's, that, um, that shows that those engine hours, that comes from the engine manufacturers, because these days, like everything, all the servicing is all electronic. So, so they've got these incredible data sets. But these are data sets recognised like by people like the EPA in the US. Okay, now, these are these are third party accredited sort of data sets that everyone sort of looks at and goes, no, no, that that's the right set, and it's reflective of the vast majority of use. So sure, there's outliers. There's some people that might use their boats all the time and go, well, I use my boat 200 years hours a year. Great. Yep. Um, but that's not where the majority not, of it is. So yeah. if we come back to this point, we are trying to work out how to decarbonise the recreational marine industry so our industry can meet the Paris Agreement. To do that, we need to move the bulk of the industry in a particular direction. So we're using data sets that reflect the bulk of the industry. And I think those engine hours are such an important part of it. Um, and I guess there's one more point yeah. I'd like to make, which I think is really <laughs> important, is that we should be very proud as an industry about um, the longevity of our products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, durability is a key component of sustainability. And although we aren't addressing the materials, we do, we actually take into account the LCA, the embodied carbon of actually building each of these craft. But for the propulsion systems, it's fundamentally the same. Yeah. So um, it's sort of a, a standard type thing. It's the propulsion systems that change. But these craft are incredibly durable and they last for incredible amounts of time. So if you look at it and say, for instance, a high-performance motor yacht has a life of 50 years. So well, you, yeah, it could be even more. We don't really know yet, No, do this we? is saying what we're, yeah. again, we're using the means yeah. of yeah. basically saying this is what the reasonable expectation is. Like, you know, the, the probably the, the, the shortest lifespan of some of them might be the inflatable tenders and things like that. Sure. But that's still 10 years. Yep. You know, but, it, but on, on average, boats last a lot longer than cars, as an example. And so um, it's an important part because that durability and the embodied carbon in that in that craft, particularly, say, the existing fleet, there's enormous value in the carbon that's already spent in building the existing fleet. So we need to find ways to actually be able to, you know, stretch that out for as long as possible because when you build a new craft, you know, half 
You know, for a lot of craft, half the embodied carbon for the whole life of the craft is in the manufacturing phase. Yeah. Okay. You know, in a car, it's about ten to fifteen percent. Yeah. But for a boat, it's about half. And so, depending on which boat it is, of course, but it gives you a sense as to the differences between the two. That's a really interesting stat, and and I guess the beauty of boats and what we see happen with boats as opposed to cars is they get completely refurbished, updated, all those sorts of things during that fifty years, don't they? Whereas um, a car, you might say, okay, it's it's feeling really dated and really the the seats are worn out and the and the stereo is not what it used to be and all those sorts of things car gets changed to new car. But with boats, we have that beautiful option of because of all the trades available and the and the wonderful companies that do different things. I mean, SeaTac are a perfect example of this. You can turn an old boat into a completely new one. Um, but often the engines and the hull, which is where most of the carbon was spent in its build, are still left in place, aren't they? Absolutely. And I think that's such an, it's a key element of it. I think, and that's one of the challenge with emerging technologies, for instance, because some of those emerging technologies don't have lives that match the length of the craft. Battery technology, for instance, is a classic example that, that really um, the current technologies, the emerging technologies are indicating that the life is around, you know, 10, maybe 15 years at a push, but they start to uh, reduce performance. So if you've got to then start replacing those through the course and the life of a boat, then it has it has carbon consequences. And so yeah. all of those types of things, when you do a full LCA analysis, cradle to grave, you have to take into account all of that, to, that, that those elements. You have to look at the life of each of the materials and allow for replacement of the during the life of the craft as well. So and that, that is a real challenge with the current technology of batteries, isn't it? Yeah. Because they do have a limited life, um, yeah. whereas the boats have a very long life. Yeah. So we, we, I guess we do really na- need to take that into account, don't we? Yeah. Um, I've been talking to New Zealanders and they've told me that uh, electric cars are being abandoned because their um, battery cost is so much greater than the value of the car and obviously the impact of that is not good at all so so before we continue that amazing interview with our current guest a little interlude from us here at the boat princess if you'd like to be a guest on the boat princess simply send us an expression of interest to our email at info at theboatprincess.com or send us a dm on instagram we are the boat princess on Instagram, and uh, we'll send you our media kit and details as to how we work. Um, the The podcast is incredibly popular worldwide, and there is nothing like getting forty five minutes or so of somebody's ears entirely dedicated to what you're trying to achieve, or perhaps what your company is trying to achieve. So we look forward to hearing from you. You've looked at um, the LCA. Is there any other areas of decarbonisation you've looked at on this stu- in this study? Um, so I guess one of the things when we've evaluated uh, all of the different propulsion types is that we've then got to look and to say, can you actually do a proper um, you know, apples for apples comparison using that sort of colloquialism, but you, can you actually do a, a, a full comparison? One of the challenges is you can't. Um, and the reason being is just as an example, the difference between the energy density of um, a battery or the energy density of compressed hydrogen is substantially less than the energy density of either of liquid fuels. Now, whether that's a fossil fuel or whether it's a sustainable fuel, there's such a dramatic difference between the two. To give just as an example, in, in round terms, um, a lithium-ion battery uh, has one thirtieth of the energy density, you know, of diesel. Wow. Okay. And so, so in, in now, electric propulsion is more efficient in taking stored energy in a battery and converting it into forward propulsion by you know maybe three hundred percent. But you still need ten to eleven times if you want to get the same range and performance. You'd need ten to eleven times the volume of volume of liquid fuel that you're storing on your boat in batteries. Oh, which with boats you can't do it. Big so, issue, so, so, sinking type stuff. Yeah, so <laughs> so I think that 
one of the things, and this is one of the, the exercises that Ricardo had to go through, is that they then needed to evaluate um, what, is, what is a sensible comparison. And in essence, you know, because you can't, you know, the, the boat has to have a functional area, it has to have all of these type of things. So on the smaller craft, we ended up with um, range and performance of about 20% of the fossil fuel equivalent. On the high performance motor yacht, it was only 10%. Now, is that consumer acceptable? Is that all of those things? That's not really dealt with specifically within the report, but it's it's just important for everyone to understand. So even when we get to the results, um, we're not comparing an apples for apples comparison. We're comparing what's considered to be the practical implementation of current technologies and projected performance of those technologies over the next 10 year period. And so um, that that is, you know, so when you're really trying to look at how to decarbonize things, you can't just, you can't use theory. You've got to be practical and say, well, you know, maybe, you know, the decision is that if you had to go down that pathway, then, then the usage profile, uh, the consumer expectation needs to be managed to meet the limitations. Um, and the other part that we looked at was to go, um, you can't, you know, this is recreational boating. It's a discretional activity. You can't ignore the cost consequences either. So we evaluated the cost consequences of the alternatives based on where things stand now and what they're projected to do um, because, like we're all experiencing across the economy, um, you know, we've had, you know, a lot of our prosperity has been based on the freely available fossil fuels mm. and, the, and the cost effectiveness of that. The alternatives, you know, in a large sense are more expensive and so you've, um, you need to work that through. Now, I think importantly... Um, dramatic um, improvements have been made in engine efficiency and uh, reduction of emissions over the last decade that have actually seen engines, you know, dramatically improve in performance. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of factors that actually come into play to try and build a model around how you actually make all of this work. And I think they're the things that are built into the Ricardo study. So just to, to simplify a little bit of that for our listeners, fundamentally with the current technology, say on a bigger boat, I say a 50-foot uh, motor cruiser, you cannot put enough batteries in it to give it its current range and power without sinking the boat because the weight fundamentally is just too great in that boat. Um, but um, it seems that, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all we're talking about here. You this This study has revealed that different solutions are better for different styles of craft. Is, is that the way we were looking at this? Yeah, look, I think the if we look to what the outcomes are, and I think that's let's just sort of get down to it, there is no one size fits all because you do need to look at the specific use cases. However, if you look at the data set that we've used, which is the reflection of the vast majority of the industry, then... For normal recreational use, the best way to decarbonise the recreational marine industry is through the use of sustainable drop-in fuels. And the reason being is that there is, and one of the things that was uncovered is that in looking at each of the alternatives, the amount of embodied carbon within the manufacturing processes, particularly for batteries, is substantial. Mm. And because the operating hours are so low, you can't offset it. And so in some respects, there are numerous examples of, in the study where the carbon footprint of the electrical alternative, recognising that it only had 20% of the performance, has a higher carbon footprint than the fossil fuel alternative. Now, that sort of, that was a bit of a, that was a great surprise to yeah. us. And in fact, probably the most, the craft that stood out to me as, as the most surprising was actually um, the sailing yacht. Okay. And the reason being is that the average engine hours on a sailing yacht is only 28 hours a year. Of course, because they're using wind. Because you want to get the sails up, which is, you know, the best way to decarbonise the sailing yacht is to use your sails. But, yeah. But as a consequence, um, you know, the ability, the, the the embodied carbon within it. And so once again, sailing lot, yachts have got a long life. Battery life is, is limited, so you have to replace the batteries due to the term. And so as a consequence, the carbon footprint of, of of that alternative was significant compared to the alternatives. But the drop-in fuel alternative, you know, sees dramatic reductions. In fact, if we had a if we had a pathway for the recreational marine industry today that gave us the, the sustainable fuels that we need, 
then we'd meet the Paris Agreement. And the reason we would was that that the sustainable fuels, and I'll use the US figures because uh, you know I've got I've got them to hand in terms of they they have great access to data in the US, and they've got volume there at they've boating. Got so. so, and look in 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 most respects, the record. Uh, the US market or North American market is a, it reflects 50% of the global recreational marine industry in round figures. So there's about, I think they uh, there's 12 and a half million boats in the US. Um, there's about 30 million worldwide, but there's 12 and a half million existing boats in the US. Now they sell 250,000 new boats per year. So quick math says that it'd take 25 years to replace the existing fleet yeah. over time. And the existing fleet's got at least a mean life of about 20 years. So if you really want to decarbonise, you're going to have to come up with a solution that decarbonises the existing fleet. The new fleet has a very little impact mm. um, on the on the, the overall position. And so um, sustainable drop-in fuels, obviously, that you can put into the existing engines and utilise them um, are clearly a great way to... to um, decarbonise existing fleet, but importantly, um, the conclusion of the of the report, which was to deal with new craft, came to the same conclusion. Uh, and so, in that sense, there's there's uh, a symmetry between between that, and that sort of be- creates this outcome that says sustainable fuels. Now, we did test, as an example, a higher PWC. Okay. And we, we used 156 hours and we assumed that the PwC would have a battery um, that enabled it to operate for, you know, under two hours. So in other words, a higher operator could let it out for an hour, it could run through, you had some contingency in the way that it was done, and then it had come back fast charge and maybe there was you had to have two craft or something like that. But in that particular case, that's a great example of where electrical um, solutions work really well. Yeah. Because then you can, then it's clean, it it's, doesn't have much noise, it's all of those sorts of, I mean, there's no emissions coming out of a, a tailpipe and all those sorts of things for that particular circumstance. And so providing you can work with the functionality of it, we tested that as a use case. And because the engine hours were higher, then you could offset it, particularly if you were prepared to have a smaller battery because so much of the carbon's in the battery. So like I said, no one size fits all. But to decarbonise the recreational marine industry to, to meet the Paris Agreement, the answer is sustainable drop-in fuels. And the the conclusion on the sailing yacht was? Um, same thing, sustainable drop-in fuel. Yeah, even even for a sailing yacht. Even for a sailing yacht because yeah. the, the um, carbon footprint of the electric alternative over an LCA analysis, cradle to grave, was greater than you know, the alternatives. And so, you know, the sustainable fuels really step forward as the as the solution to those issues. Yeah. So I guess really simplifying it down, thinking about all of those, what did we say, 12 and a half million in the US boats? 12 and a half million, yeah. Sitting there. Um, yeah, to take all of their current engines out of them and replace them with an alternative you're immediately taking away you've you've made a massive carbon imprint by creating those engines and keeping that engine going with a biofuel or a sustainable fuel is far far better than creating a new engine which it which uses a whole bunch of carbon in doing that and then placing it in the boat and disposing of the old one as well it's 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 a, it's that's what you've got to think about, isn't it? Yeah, because but, boats go for so long, and uh, we like to call it the carbon balance sheet. So, in other words, we've the carbon used in the manufacturing of the existing fleet has already been discharged into the atmosphere. Mm. But as a consequence, we have an asset. The embodied carbon in the craft that's made is actually an asset. So, the best way to reduce carbon is to use that as much as possible um, in terms of longevity and use it for as long as possible. So I guess to put a fine point on it, that if you if you had uh, an engine failure, as an example, within a within a yacht that was 20 years old, what propulsion system should you replace it with? So we're going to continue that interview with Darren Vo in a second episode of the Boat Princess podcast. So that will be the one following this one in our list of, gosh, so many episodes now. It's very exciting to be such um, an inspiring podcast for many um, talking 
to so many amazing people in boating and the boating industry. I feel very privileged to do so, but this is a particularly interesting subject. So we thought we'd uh, spread it over to episodes for you to really understand those findings. And if you'd like further information and you're in the boating industry, contact your uh, AMIA association uh, in your country, or you can go to propellingourfuture.com. That site will be con- continue to be a resource for both the boating industry and legislators um, to see what the boating industry is doing to make change and propel into our future. Thanks so much for listening, everyone. It's always great to have your ears on board. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you on the water soon.